turn to Haiti, a country yet again in turmoil. In many Western articles about Haiti, one will find that it is almost immediately mentioned that it is the poorest country in the Western Hemisphere. However, it was also the first independent black nation in the Western Hemisphere and first post-colonial independent black-led nation in the world. It is also the only nation whose independence was gained as a part of a successful slave rebellion. The reason I mention this is because when we talk about geopolitics, it is important to consider history. It is important to place countries within their historical context and understand the history of its political economy. Today we talk to Brian Concannon, a human rights lawyer and foreign policy advocate. He is the executive director of Project Blueprint, which worked for a human rights-based U.S. foreign policy by bringing the perspectives of people abroad that are impacted by U.S. policies into policy discussion and advocacy. Concannon founded the Institute for Justice and Democracy in Haiti, the IJDH, and also co-managed the Bureau des Avocats Internationales, BAI, Haiti's only public interest law office between 1996 and 2004. The work of Concannon and his colleagues at the BAI and IGDH is a subject of How Human Rights Can Build Haiti by Professor Fran Quigley, a case study by Harvard University's project on justice in times of transition. We talk about Haiti, we talk about its history, we talk about its recent president has recently been assassinated by foreign mercenaries. We talk about his work while he was in Haiti and what's hopefully to come for the country. I hope you enjoy the podcast. Thank you so much. Hello, Mr. Concannon. Thank you so much for joining the podcast today. Um, one of the reasons I wanted to have you on um, is to discuss Haiti. Um, obviously, it's making a ton of news right now because um, its, uh, it's, its president has been assassinated. And um, I'm sure you've been giving a lot of media interviews. You've been giving a lot of your analysis. Uh, you were a UN human rights uh, um, lawyer. Um, in that country, uh, founded a variety of organizations uh, between 1994 and 2004, I believe you, you, you said. Uh, you can correct me uh, um, later in the conversation if you'd like, but um, instead of just jumping in and talking about this assassination, I always think it's beneficial um, to put uh, a lot of these events in historical context. So um, if you're able to, can you provide some context and background um, uh, about Haiti, I guess, from a um, foreign audience that may not be so used to, um, you know, discussing this or hearing this in um, traditional Western media. And maybe that'll lead us into some of the work you've done over the years and, um, and kind of where we are now. Um, please. Well, thanks, Jody, for, sure. for inviting me on to the podcast, but even more for asking that question. Uh, I think it's really important to explore the context. I think that too often in the West, when we discuss what's happening in places like Haiti, we um, are somewhat myopic. We're just looking at what happened in the last week or month or year. And all those events are determined by, by a much deeper context, much of which we're responsible for. And if you ask Haitians about, about current events, they will typically start at least as far back as 1803. Okay. And that's when Haiti became independent. Uh, it was the first and only uh, independent country to become independent as a result of a slave revolt. Um, it was the second independent country in the Americas. Uh, you would have expected the first independent in the country in the Americas to welcome the second one. But of course, we didn't. We right. slapped an embargo on Haiti. We did not recognize Haiti. We tried to do everything we could to keep Haiti from succeeding. And that was because we had slaves ourselves. So we couldn't accept that freed slaves would could run a successful country because that would undermine the foundations of our own economy. And we couldn't recognize Haiti until 1864 when we uh, went just after President Lincoln signed the Emancipation Proclamation. And you know, there's, there's a lot of more detail in the 200 years since then, but briefly, uh, the US has always um, ill-served Haiti, and in part because Haiti was a bad example of living up to the ideals that we profess, but that we were not living up to. Uh, in 1803, it was this all men were created equal. Of course, we meant the men part, but we didn't, didn't mean the all part. 
Um, you know, more recently, Haiti Haitians are insisting on a broad-based popular democracy where the people really decide things, not economic elites and political elites. And I think that is threatening to the United States as well. And we just prefer to support Haitian leaders who will listen to the U.S. and implement policies that U.S. leaders like rather than what Haitian voters uh, elect them to do. And um, you know, the more, more immediate context with the current, uh, you know, that, 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 that surrounds the assassination of President Moise is the fact that for the last 10 years, uh, President Moise's party, it's called the PHTK party in Haiti, they have presided over the deliberate dismantlement of Haiti's democracy. Um, that has included an increase in brutality and political violence. And you know, President Moise's assassination is tragic, but it's only just the latest in a long line of political violence, especially over the last four years. And there's hundreds of deaths that happened in that that are equally tragic to President Moise's. Sure. No, I appreciate that. So, um, so it's it's great that you started off in in its early history. I guess maybe bring us into the 20th century. What was Haiti like in the 20th century? Can you talk talk about um, its political landscape and even maybe some of its leaders, um, like as a summary, sort of throughout the the 20th century? What was that country like in the backyard of American hegemony? Well, a big chunk of the 20th century in Haiti was taken up by the, the father and son dictatorship of Jean-Claude um, and, and Francois Duvalier, which again received substantial U.S. support. Um, there's, there's been, in addition to the Duvaliers, most, most of the presidents in Haiti were unelected. In fact, Haiti did not have a president who was elected and passed power on to, and served his entire term in office and passed power on to an elected successor until 2001 wow. when, uh, when President Preval uh, handed power over to President Aristide. Now, President Aristide was elected twice, once in 1990 and once in, in 2000, but he never, and both times he actually passed power on to an elected successor but he was never able to serve out his whole term because twice he was, his, his uh, term was interrupted by, by coup d'etats. Uh, the second of the two in 2004 was really engineered by the Bush administration. Uh, President Aristide was placed on a US plane and whisked out of the, the country to the, to the Central African Republic. Uh, and during the, the time when I, I lived in Haiti from, from 1995 until 2004, and that was a time of unparalleled democratic progress in Haiti. And you had the only handover from an elected president to another. Um, you also had impressive improvements in governance and just getting parliament to work, the police to work. Um, you had increases in public health, in education, and in my work in the justice system. And you know, Haiti still had a lot of problems, but it was the problems of a democracy and especially a poor one, but was making really significant strides. Uh, most of that progress came to a halt when the US kidnapped Haiti's president in 2004. And Haiti has never gotten back to, uh, to the point that it was in, in 2003 before the US started to, to overthrow its democracy. You had uh, in 2000, Six, President Preval came back into office for a second term, uh, and you had some democratic openings. But really, since 2010, you've had this PHTK in power uh, that's been, been to a large extent propped up by, by uh, U.S. generosity, and they've been involved in spectacular corruption and persistent dismantling of the structures of Haiti's democracy. Where Haiti is now, um, is that there hasn't been a parliament in uh, a year and a half. That's because the uh, President Moise allowed their terms to expire without running elections. You haven't had um, a year ago, all the local officials, their terms expired without a replacement. The Supreme Court has only uh, half of its members and in part because three of the members were illegally sacked in February. Uh, the court system has been packed with loyalists the police has been politicized, you know, all throughout Haiti's uh, government, it's been 
the, the people who, who had been actually doing the work of providing basic government services have been replaced by people who are there because they're loyal to the PHTK party. Right. Um, and, and so I guess a part of this, uh, part of the events that led up to the assassination, um, um, and I guess we can get into who was behind that and, 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 and why this occurred just at all. Um, I guess part of the reason was that the president, were, he, was in, uh, he was rewriting the constitution. I mean, what, what, what was the grievance that, that led up to this? How, how should we think about the assassination? Well, I think the important, the most important context is that you had a, uh, a greatly increasing amount of political violence uh, and that, that was aided and abetted by the PhDK. So to some extent, I think that regardless of who actually pulled the trigger, uh, to some extent, this was President Moise living by the sword and dying by the sword. Right. In terms of who actually pulled the trigger, you know, there, are, there are many theories. Um, I don't have enough information to, to make me to give me any confidence that one is, is more likely than the other. Um, but I'm fairly confident that, that, that it didn't have to do with the legitimate grievances over his, over his trying to uh, rewrite the constitution, okay. which was illegal or the other kind of mainstream political opposition. Um, I've been in touch with, with, with patients who are uh, you know, political actors, human rights activists, grassroots activists, they are all deeply um, saddened and scared by this. All of them are, are, were very staunch opponents to President Moise. They were taking to the streets. They were doing whatever they could to organize. Sure. But they didn't want him in, a, him in a cemetery. They wanted him in a courthouse right. uh, facing his, his crimes. And they know that, this, that this, the kind of instability that this uh, killing could lead to is, can, can very much hurt them and that things get very worse. It, it seems to me much more likely that the assassination was done by someone who, who felt not a broad political interest, but a more personal power interest uh, from, from killing the president. Well, we do know that there are foreign nationals in custody that are um, being accused, uh, two of which I believe now, two of which are American citizens. And there have been wide reports that these um, individuals have been trained by um, uh, U.S. special forces or U.S. military, various uh, military apparatus within the United States. I don't know um, what that means, if anything, or if you can speak to that. Have you heard anything about, about this or what should we make of that? There are three Haitian Americans who have been arrested. Okay. Uh, two of them, the DEA has confirmed that they were DEA agents. Uh, DEA, sorry, not DEA agents, DEA informants. Right. Um, I haven't seen anything that makes it likely that that status had anything to do with, with the, the assassination. It's possible, but I haven't seen any evidence. Right. There also have been, um, <clears throat> I believe, numbers now up to 17 Colombians who have been arrested, and right. they're all former Colombian soldiers. Uh, many of them have received U.S. training. Uh, but again, I haven't seen any connection between uh, between the, the, the Colombians' U.S. training and their involvement in the the assassination. So I don't, I haven't seen them. It's possible, but I haven't seen any direct U.S. role in the assassination itself. Right. But of course, there's an extremely strong and persistent U.S. role in helping to create this climate of political violence and in supporting the PHTK dismantling of Haiti's democracy. I mean, that happened under President Trump, and it, it, it's been continued, uh, perhaps even accelerated under President Biden. Right. Um, you said you have been in contact with many of your former colleagues and people that are living um, and working in Haiti still today. Um, what are they telling you? What is it like there today? I mean, I know we, we're we seeing some images, in some cases, some stock footage from years prior of um, some of the violence in the streets and some of the uh, sort of unraveling of, of the societal order. Um, what are you hearing from them? And what, do you know what's happening right now? Um, you know, what I'm hearing so far is that things are relatively 
calm. Okay. People are terrified. People are really sure. scared that things can get much worse. It seems for the last, you know, since in the eight days since the assassination, that things have been relatively calm. In fact, calmer than they were in the eight days before. Right. On on the uh, on June 29th and 30th, there were there were uh, two massacres that happened that killed about 20 people, including a journalist and a human rights activist. That appears to to have been done by by gangs allied with the government. Uh, and so Haitians are used to this unraveling. Uh, they're, they're, they, you know, they've un unfortunately been accustomed to the violence. Sure. There's, um, you know, there's a risk of war, and they're very worried about that. That has not, to my knowledge, happened. Although, of course, there's lots of things that are unknown. Every lots of people in Haiti are are laying low, and that includes journalists. So there could be things happening, um, in including political violence that aren't getting reported. Right. Do you know what's happening on the political front? I mean, I know the interim government um, have have uh, it was widely reported that they requested uh, 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 U.S. intervention, U.S. military aid. Um, uh, but of course, that's that's all. Uh, the, you know, how should we understand that? I mean, uh, do you know what's come of this? Sure. There there are two tracks in terms of in terms of the succession. One track is that there are two people who are claiming to be prime minister, um, neither of them constitutional, both to some extent named by President Moise illegally. Right. And both are, are, are trying to make the case that their, that their nomination is, is less illegal than the other person's. The international community seems mostly engaged in trying to resolve that dispute. Although most people are, are um, are, including the U.S., are putting their efforts uh, squarely behind um, one of the claimants, uh, whose name is Claude Joseph. But the other track is Haitians who are saying, look, both of the, of the illegal claimants are part of this system that has brought so much misery and violence upon the Haitian people, including President Moise's assassination. Neither of them can credibly have the credibility needed to put Haiti back on the path towards democracy. And so Haitian groups are saying, first of all, that the, they want the international community to stop doing things, to stop considering sending soldiers, to stop supporting the, the PHTK government, and to stop trying to force uh, these flawed elections on the Haitian people that will, are really just designed to perpetuate PHTK par power and will not put Haiti back on track. And what Haitian society, civil society is saying that if the U.S. stops propping up PHTK, then they will be forced to negotiate with the almost universal opposition in Haiti and that a Haitian-led solution can emerge, which will create a government that has the credibility to run elections and allow the Haitian people to decide who gets to lead them. Um, that is, and, and people are, for the first few days after the assassination, the progress on that was very slow, although Haitians have been meeting for months to try to create some kind of uh, a, a consensus around around the next steps, and, and although that that process was was delayed by the assassination uh, in the last this week, people have been accelerating that, and there are some very uh, promising proposals coming out from civil society groups that the international community is completely ignoring, but are the the only viable paths out of of Haiti's current crisis. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Um, I guess turning back to history a little bit, um, can you tell me what the what, what's what is the American interest? What is the U.S. interest in Haiti? I know uh, there was a clip that was going around, I believe, of Joe Biden in maybe the late 90s, early 2000s, where he famously, uh, maybe not famously, but he said, uh, if Haiti were to fall into the ocean or rise from the ashes, it wouldn't matter very much. It seems like he was indicating because it's not very resource rich or that there's really no real financial benefit to um, American power. It's really a sort of, uh, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a non-interest in terms of U.S. hegemony. Um, but it seems to have certainly a, a long and toward history with the Haitians and propping up um, a variety of, of, of its governments. What's, what's going on here? There, there's a sharp disconnect between the perception of U.S.-Haiti relationships and the reality. The perception is that it was kind of uh, 
well described by, by President Biden, the Senator Biden at the time, that Haiti's kind of this problem that we are occasionally required to deal with and we kind of hope it would disappear. The reality is, is that the U.S. persistently and consistently invests significant resources into, uh, into maintaining Haiti as a subservient state to the U.S. Until, until the, um, the Afghanistan mission, the occupation of Haiti was the longest uh, U.S. occupation of any country. I guess, I guess South Korea, Korea as well. That's, right. that's, that's slightly different. But in terms of occupying a country, Haiti's, the occupation of Haiti from 1915 to 1934 um, was the longest U.S. occupation before, uh, before the Afghanistan uh, occupation. And the U.S. was there for a long time. They built a lot of roads, uh, reinstituting slavery to do that. But they did not leave Haiti with any stronger democratic institutions. And in fact, they left Haiti with an army and a government that was dependent and uh, reliant on, on the United States. Um, and, and that kind of investment has continued. The one of the longest peacekeeping missions in history was in Haiti, following the departure of President Aristide in, in 2004. That lasted until, that lasted for 13 years until 2017, and the remnant of that mission is still there. Uh, that mission spent over $7 billion. Uh, the lion's share of that was from U.S. taxpayers, and it's the only peacekeeping mission in UN history that was deployed not to keep the peace. There was no peace treaty, mm -hmm. but it was, it was deployed to consolidate a coup d'etat. Uh, the US didn't like President Aristide and, and the Lavalas movement that he represented. And they, they spent all that money, $7 billion, 13 years, to make sure that, that the Lavalas party was not able to come back into power in Haiti. Uh, and you know, throughout history, you can take time after time that the US has been involved spending resources, sending soldiers um, to Haiti to make sure that Haiti was, was um, that, that Haiti's leaders were willing to follow US policy prescriptions, not Haitians policy prescriptions. Mm -hmm. Fascinating. Okay, yeah, I didn't um, uh, know. Hey, one thing no. I forgot to add. So the, sure. Haiti, the US built an embassy in Haiti that, I, that at the time it was built, it was just a few years ago, was the second biggest US embassy in the world wow. behind the one in Baghdad. Okay, wow. Um, so how has Haiti looked at, I guess, uh, from the perspective of other Latin American countries? So I mean, I mean, uh, there have been some success stories from Latin American and Central American companies that have been able to somewhat stave off American intervention. Um, is, is there, is, is there a, um, a sort of solidarity among Latin American countries that are looking to Haiti or um, how, how can we understand that? I mean, I understand that the Dominican Republic is now reinforcing its border wall with the country. Um, how, how can I understand that better? Uh, it's really complicated. So the DR okay. is, is the closest, has the closest relationship with Haiti, and that's a very complicated one. Sure. Uh, Haitians kind of staff the, 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 the DR's workforce in the same right. way that immigrants from Latin America staff the United States in sure. construction and, right. um, and a lot of other similar work. Right. Um, and the DR is reliant on Haiti. The DR has all, often been kind of the quickest and most generous responder to Haiti in emergencies. Uh, but it is also, the DR has been involved in massacres of Haitians sure. uh, back, back in 1937, more recently in illegal mass deportations of Haiti. So it's a pretty complicated relationship. Um, there's been some other solidarity um, generous solidarity actions. Cuba comes to mind since um, since 19, I believe since 1996, Cuban doctors have been in Haiti um, and, and Cuba has taken uh, hundreds of Haitian um, medical students and educated them in Haiti. Uh, so then that's been you know, unequivocally positive. Uh, some of the other, another um, in, in initially generous offering that became problematic was um, Venezuela included Haiti in the Petro Caribe program. Right. And Petro Caribe allowed uh, mostly poor countries in the Americas to, uh, to get Venezuelan oil that was discounted, but more important was financed by the Venezuelan government. So mm -hmm. Haiti 
got got this oil, was able to sell it on the market, and then uh, had to pay had very generous repayment terms to Venezuela, no money down, or very little money down, and then payments that became due later. And the idea was that that the countries that were recipients would sell the money, use the money, sell, sell the oil, use the proceeds of that to build infrastructure, sure. help move the economies up, and then be able to repay the, uh, the funds down the road. Unfortunately, in Haiti, what happened was there was massive corruption. Uh, right. And the money was basically stolen. So that started under the under President Preval, but it accelerated under President Martelly and President Moise. There's very little that Haitians have to show for it now, except a, a debt that I believe is, uh, is it's over two billion dollars that Haitian taxpayers are now having to pay back. So that unfortunately was something that could have done some good, but but in reality it didn't. Um, otherwise, Haiti's relationship with the rest of Latin America has been has been um, uneven. Um, you know, kind of a and, and <clears throat> I hate to keep going back too much to history, but no, please but this do. Is actually very. Uh, this this explains kind of a whole history of U.S. Latin American relationships. In um, in eighteen, I believe it was around uh, the, around eighteen. Well, in the early, early in the early eighteen hundreds, um, Simon Bolivar was was. Um, was kicked out of South America, and he was, he was looking for refuge for his soldiers. And he and um, Haiti's president Alexander Pétion uh, gave him refuge and <clears throat> helped him arm and and supplied him. In return, uh, Pétion said, "All I ask in repayment is that you issue a proclamation emancipating all the slaves in South America." Um, and he even gave <clears throat> he even gave. Um, Patreon, I uh, even gave uh, Bolivar a printing press to, to, to print out the Emancipation Proclamation. Bolivar gets equipped by Haiti, heads back to, uh, to, to, to South America, um, starts his war of rebellion, even starts printing out the, the Emancipation Proclamation, but he loses and uh, gets kicked out of, of, out of, uh, out of uh, South America, again comes back to Haiti, regroups and then has another attack. This time it was successful, but this time it was a much more limited revolution that he was doing, including that he that he made alliances with slave owners and did not um, emancipate the slaves. And in fact, right after, after a few years after he, he consolidated power in South America and consolidated the independence of several um, independent countries in South America, he organized um, a big Congress called the Congress of Americas to try to bring together all of the independent countries in the hemisphere. And he invited the United States. He did not invite Haiti. The US pushed him to exclude Haiti. And even though he owed his, his, his success to the Haitians, he complied with the US and he uh, did not allow Haiti into, the, into that Congress. And, since then, that's that has typified relationships. There's obviously language barriers. Haitians speak uh, Haitian Creole and French. Um, they're dark skinned than most of than most uh, residents in other South American countries. You know, racism cannot be discounted anytime you talk about relationships between between other countries and Haiti. Uh, but also, South American countries have been in uh, under significant pressure from from the United States and the European countries not to let Haiti succeed. So there, there is not the type, there has not been the type of solidarity that one would expect or one would certainly hope for from Latin America. You know, another more recent example, in, in 2004, when, um, when the U.S. kidnapped uh, Haiti's President Aristide, uh, initially U.S. troops were, were, um, were controlling the country and making sure that, that the coup d'etat was consolidated. But at that time, the U.S. was was losing wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, so U.S. soldiers were were needed elsewhere. Um, what President Bush did was he, he he got the U.N. Security Council to authorize a peacekeeping mission and got Brazil to lead it. And Brazil, there's there's uh, there's uh, cables from the Brazilian embassy and the U.S. embassy that confirm this. But Brazil knew that this was not a justified peacekeeping mission. Sure. Uh, it just didn't fit chapter seven, which is great breaches right. of international peace. And that didn't happen. Right. But Brazil took the, took the position anyway, because they, they felt that was a, a, an opportunity for them to 
prove themselves worthy of a Security Council yep. permanent seat. Of right. course, they never got the seat, sure. and, but they proved themselves worthy by, by repressing Haitian democracy. Right. Yeah, that's yeah, that's a fascinating history of the country. Um, you did speak briefly about a, a period, uh, and you have to remind me when exactly that was again, where you said things were actually looking up for Haiti. There was some um, actual um, institutional growth and um, uh, some positive changes um, that were happening. Can you describe some of the um, underpinning economic items that were happening there that that, that fostered uh, um, you know Haiti kind of getting out of its dire situation for years. What what, what were some of those things that were happening during that time? And when was that again? This was from 1994 until until 2004. And what happened in 1994 was um, was President Aristide was restored. Um, sure. And actually, with and and you know, I'm very critical of of the of the. UN intervention from after 2004, but this one was actually a pretty good intervention. It was done at the request of the elected government. Um, it had broad international support, and the mission really was there to to help build Haiti's democratic structures. And I was I wasn't part of the peacekeeping, the military part, but I was part of the the human rights mission that 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 accompanied the uh, the, the military mission. And there really was a strong sense. Um, within the international community, that this was a chance to to uh, to help Haiti break from its history of dictatorships and create the structures that you needed for for uh, a successful democratic state, and that includes a, a broader based economy. Um, and what happened? I mean, you actually had the development of the structures. You had nine years of political stability. You had the handoff, two handoffs from an elected president to another. You had you know, it was it was controversial and kind of a mess, but you had the development of of parliamentary democracy. You had the the army, which had always been kind of both an economic and a political predator, was was demobilized and replaced with a civilian police force that was you know that had its share of problems, but was not overthrowing governments and um, you know and and extorting peasants and, and and stealing a huge amount of money from from the government uh, right. treasury and you also had an investment in kind of basic government services education health care transportation and all of these are the types of things that underpin successful economies uh, there was increased foreign investment because foreign investors saw that it was a stable government and you, you had a general broadening of the base of the economy and his economy has always been extremely narrow where the, the, the economic elites control almost everything with very little bit of a middle class. Um, the, 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 the middle class was broadening, people were doing small businesses. And again, because the economic elites didn't have the army to enforce their stranglehold, you had this broadening and this development of, of, of a middle class. Uh, but that was apparently the problem. That's why Asian elites, along with the U.S., decided to to uh, to first undermine, then to overthrow Haiti's government. The undermining actually started in the tail end of the uh, of the Clinton administration in 2000. Uh, there was frustration that Haiti was was not privatizing some of its uh, government, some of its state-owned industries fast enough. Um, this was things like the electric company and the telephone company. Um, and, and the U.S. had decided that Haiti needed to privatize those. <clears throat> it was, it, you know, th those measures were, were, were somewhat unpopular, at least controversial in Haiti, but the U.S. had said, you know, that's the benchmark that we're going to judge, um, judge the Haitian government by, not its ability to provide education and health care and democracy. Um, so Haiti was not doing well by that standard. And the, the Clinton administration started doing a development assistance embargo. It withheld not only U.S. Um, support to Haiti's government, but it pushed other entities, including the, uh, the Inter-American Development Bank, the World Bank, the UN, and pushed other countries to not give any money to the Haitian government. Uh, that policy was was increased under President Bush starting in 2001, and it was successful. I mean, it brought Haiti to its knees. It, it uh, generated significant discontent. It limited the ability of the police force to protect the country. And as a result, a very uh, small group of, 
of uh, people with substantial U.S. connections were able to come in and, and overthrow most of Haiti's government. They weren't able to take Port-au-Prince, but the U.S. intervened by putting President Daristide on a, on a plane. Yeah, it's, it certainly seems like a, one of those case studies you hear in, in, um, in international development where the IMF and World Bank and, and other, other uh, many of these international organizations, and I guess obviously certainly um, U.S. elites are, um, are pushing for um, a, a complete neoliberalization of, of their uh, economy. Yes. And, you know, even the Inter-American Development Bank, it admitted because it was it was sued by by some human rights groups. It admitted that that it, it stopped its funding um, because of pressure from the United States and admitted that that was illegal. Um, you know, under its own terms, it was supposed to be apolitical. It was not allowed to stop uh, grants that were already in the process. But again, you know, might makes right. And the U.S. said, stop, stop these loans. So the IADB compl complied. Right. Fascinating. Um, that may, that gives us a good segue into kind of what your work was uh, during the time you were living in Haiti and um, what you're doing now. I know you're the executive director of Project Blueprint. What can you tell us about um, both your work uh, at the time and, and um, kind of what your, what your involvement is now with um, uh, what's happening in the country? Sure. I first got to Haiti in 1995. I was a volunteer for the United Nations. Um, as a human rights observer. And I was part of this group that I spoke of before, the, of these people that really felt the international community could help Haiti break its cycle of, of dictatorships and create democratic structures. Um, and, you know, we were there trying to help the police, help local officials, monitor the situation, be kind of a, um, listen to what the people on the ground were saying and help try to guide this, this, um, this process. And, you know, there were critiques, there were critiques of our mission, there were critiques sure. of, the, of the military mission. But in general, you know, there was significant progress. And I think the international community should have been proud of that it was that it was making, uh, that it was contributing to that. Um, I ended up leaving the, the, the UN in 1996 and joining this group of lawyers called the Bureau des Avocats Internationaux, or International Lawyers Office. Uh, and the mission at the BAI was to help the justice system become more responsive to, to the people, um, and especially by, by doing it by pushing through emblematic human rights cases. Now, Haiti had been, in 1996, Haiti had, had its elector, elected president restored. It had a more or less elected parliament, but the third branch of, of government was the justice system, and that was much harder to to democratize, you know, the, the justice system had developed over the course of centuries to serve whoever had the guns and the money. And it was, it's not easy, it still hasn't been done. It's not easy to get a system like that to turn on a dime. I mean, everything about the system was designed to, to, uh, to, to not be democratic from the way the judges were paid, which was not enough. So they relied on bribes, <clears throat> so the way the papers were kept, to the way the trials were held, juries were chosen. Um, and what we were trying to do was to, to help make the, the, the justice system more democratic. And what we were doing was we were taking um, prominent human rights cases and forcing them through the justice system. So uh, working with judges and prosecutors and police who wanted to be helpful. We worked with uh, victims groups and human rights groups to apply pressure on the system where people weren't doing what they were supposed to be doing. Um, we helped to, to maximize the contributions of the international community. Um, and this actually worked. I mean, it was, it was very slow and painstaking work, but ultimately successful. Kind of our, our marquee success was this case called the Rabato trial, where we were able to convict um, the leadership, uh, both the paramilitary and military leadership of Haiti's 1991 to 1994 dictatorship for uh, a massacre of, of pro-democracy uh, civilians. And it was, you know, it's been heralded as one of the most important human rights cases ever in the Americas. And it was done by one of, one of the, the, the region's least financed and most corrupt judiciaries. But by this combination of, of providing technical support and public pressure, we were able to get a, a, a justice system that was mostly dysfunctional to function at a really high level. Um, and there were other cases that were doing that. And along with, you know, we, 
along with the work we were doing, uh, there was there was immense interest in in training judges, in equipping people, and that was by the international community. I mean, lots of judges were sent to France uh, to get extra training, and they came back with a completely new outlook on how they were supposed to do their cases. Uh, there was equipment. Uh, improvements. There was just lots of, of help that was given to the justice system, and it showed it worked. Um, you know, again, all that came crashing down in 2004 after the coup. The judges that had done a good job were uh, some were beaten, some were arrested, some were, were thrown off the bench. Uh, prosecutors, same thing. Some of the, the police officers who had made arrests were, were uh, themselves arrested because of that work. Some of the people who testified courageously were killed. Um, you know, it was really this case of the international community flushing down the toilet uh, 10 years of progress that the international community had really helped to make. Did you find yourself in any sort of precarious situations as in um, maybe the um, political opposition accusing you or because you are a white American, for example, were you accused of being an outsider or did you ever face any anything like that? As a foreigner in Haiti, you're always, you know, you always, you, yeah, you always carry your history. You know, we right. like to say, okay, I'm here to help. And, and Haitians hear that, but they also see your representative of, of, of a power structure that has, that has kept Haiti down for, for two, two centuries. And they think very correctly that people like me aren't completely aware of how we are still complicit in that, in that history. Um, and so, you know, so Haitians were always wary of me. I think that that you know, one of the things that, and I'm sure that I justified some of their concerns. Um, I know that I justified some of their concerns. I, mean, I think, you know, I like to think I'm not imperialist, but you know, we're so just like I like to think I'm not racist. But you know, as a white American, I'm so steeped in that context that, you know, that although I try hard, um, I'm never going to leave that behind me. But one of the things that was to me very exciting about Haiti is that people were very patient. And as long as I was trying, they were willing to, to patiently point out the, you know, where I was being complicit in some of that imperialism and in racism. And so I think I was able to establish relationships of at least partial trust, and we were able to get things Don't done. Don't go too hard on yourself. I was just curious because I, I've regularly traveled to Africa. Sometimes, uh, you know, it's got its own uh, sordid history with Europe. So, um, as yeah, it's a, white... a similar dynamic. But you know, I really do think we all need to be hard on ourselves. Sure. Oh, I mean, fair as enough. a man, as a white person, as an American, you know, our country and our world are not going to become more just and more stable until uh, until white men are hard on themselves. No, yeah, no, fair enough. Fair enough. Point, point, point. Well taken. <laughs> Um, tell me about Project, Project Blueprint. Um, what are you doing now? What, what are you What are you up to now? What What is um, What is your work with Haiti and and or any other organizations that you're you're um, a part of now? What, what's What's happening with you? So, following the coup d'état, I've been living in Haiti for nine years when the two thousand four coup d'état happened. When that happened, it showed me that my place was no longer in Haiti. I love living in Haiti, but I felt that that my job was to take the lessons that I learned in Haiti and bring them to the places abroad where decisions about their rights were made. You know, Haiti's coup d'etat showed me that no matter what we did in Haiti, <clears throat> and we did a lot, uh, not, no progress was sustainable as long as the US government could, could uh, reverse that progress on oil. Right. And so we started IJDH as a way of bringing Haiti's fight for democracy to the US. So we, you know, we raised money to continue the work of BAI, collaborated with them doing the legal work, but we also tried to bring their message to the to, to the U.S. public and to U.S. decision makers. So we do a, uh, we did a lot of press work. We put out reports. We worked with members of Congress. You know, tried to apply pressure on members of the executive branch and the legislative branch that were that were not being helpful. Tried to work with people who were being helpful. Um, and along the way, one of the things that, that frustrated us was that when we were complaining about a particular policy, we, we were complaining about how it was implemented in Haiti, but we also knew the same policy was being implemented in so many other places. You know, as you said, the same dynamic in Africa, the same dynamic in many countries in, throughout the Americas. And it was frustrating. You know, we were trying our best to, to change the policy from the Haiti perspective. but 
too often not being successful. And we knew that if we were able to, to speak with a louder voice, to bring in people from that were affected in other countries, that we could um, have more of an impact. And so that when I left, I left IJDH in, in 2019 and started uh, Project Blueprint, which was the idea of Project Blueprint was to try to bring together voices of people harmed by US policy in Haiti, but also in many other places, and to try to, uh, to collectively have more of an impact on US foreign policy and make it more responsive to human rights concerns. Um, you know, unfortunately, we, we got a really good start in late 2019 and early 2020. Um, things were looking good both in terms because you had an interesting discussion of foreign policy in the, in the US uh, presidential elections. Um, we were somewhat confident that there could be a new administration that would prioritize human rights policies. But then once coronavirus hit, <clears throat> that sort of prevented our organization from going through, funding fell through, we were, sort of, we were never, never able to really do what we we're hoping to do. We run the organization as a, an all volunteer uh, effort now we do what we can we are able to make some some impact but it's you know it's unfortunately been been pretty limited um, but i've been jumping into I'm, i still volunteer for my old organization institute for justice and democracy in haiti uh, and so i'm still uh, you know i have the privilege of being involved in human rights haiti human rights through them um where can people go if they want to support that work if they want to support project blueprint if they want to support uh any other organizations that you can um that you can you can tell us um where where do people go sure for for uh, the institute for justice and democracy in haiti their website is www.ijdh.org um there's also for for project blueprint it's blueprint2021.org um, and, you know, one place to, to follow what's going on in Haiti, uh, where I've been doing the most is I've been putting it on my Twitter feed and mm -hmm. I'm at Haiti justice, um, on, on Twitter. And I try to bring the things that, that my organizations are putting out, but also credible, um, information put out by Haitian leaders and, and people in solidarity with Haitians. For and, sure. Uh, both Project yeah. Blueprint and IGDH could certainly use, use support. I mean, our work is is more than ever critical and more than ever harder to support. Yeah, I'll certainly include those links uh, in the description of this podcast. Um, and yeah, is there anything else you'd like to leave us with? Is there anything um, you think that uh, Western media or Westerners in general have missed about this? Is there something critical we should be thinking about? How, what's the best way to, um, to, to, uh, to end this? Um, incredibly fascinating discussion on Haiti. Um, what should we know? Yeah, there's an enormous disconnect between how Haitians are talking about what should happen now and how the international community is. Haitians are saying three things. One, they want us to stop talking about sending soldiers. Okay. Two, they want us to stop forcing flawed elections down their throats. Three, they want, to stop, want us to stop propping up the PHTK government. Um, the international community refuses to engage with Haitians saying, stop doing things. Instead, the international community says, well, what can we do? And, you know, we want to send COVID vaccines. We want to send food. We want to send soldiers. And that is responding to a legitimate need. I mean, Haitians need security. They need, they need medical help. They need food. Um, but it is, but Haitians see that as our way of avoiding responsibility for creating the problem. And that it's only a Band-Aid, that we're willing to send them Band-Aids while we are creating the underlying problem. And um, you know, one analogy I've come up with is, is if someone has, has their hands around your throat, they're choking you, and they say, are you cold? Could you use a blanket? Do you want something to drink? And the Haitians are saying, take your hands off our throat. And they see us talking about other things as just a, a ruse that we use to trick ourselves to avoid confronting our history of creating these problems and avoid confronting our present of creating those problems. And so what they really want us to do is to not think about, about delivering vaccines. They want us to think about how we can take our hands off their throats as soon as possible. Once that's done, once you're, 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 you're dealing with the underlying problem, yes, there'll be an opportunity to talk about how vaccines and food aid are delivered, 
with a legitimate government that people can trust. Yeah, yeah, fascinating. Um, do you have any recommendations on where one can fo um, follow news, um, a critical news of, of what's happening there, not just, you know, these sort of same old sound bites that we're getting from um, the major media outlets in the United States and, and rest of the planet? Um, sure, and there's actually quite a bit out there. Even in oh, mainstream, right. you know, there's, been, there's been great op-eds in, in the Washington Post, okay. and that was a good contrast to the Washington Post editorial calling for troop intervention. Um, there was one put out last week, actually the same day, there was a, a great op-ed um, that, that involved advocating listening to Haitians, and at the, at the same time, another one was posted by a university professor basically saying we need to take over Haiti. Uh, so there's a range of things in both mainstream and non-mainstream. You know, the, the, the I don't know of one website that is curating sure. all of it. I would look at IGDH's website. I would also look at the Center for Economic and Policy Research. Uh, they're doing great blog posts as well as as uh, featuring good analyses, but really the best place that I know of is is Twitter feeds of a few different people. One is the at Haiti Watch, another is mine, which is at Haiti Justice. Okay, fantastic. Thank you so much, Bron Concan. I really appreciate your time. Um, fascinating, fascinating conversation, and I'm certainly happy to uh, keep this conversation going with you. Uh, if you'd ever like to come back on, let's stay in touch, and I'm uh, happy to um, um, continue uh, updates with Haiti. Well, thank you, Jody. I really appreciate your great questions and this, this deep discussion. And I'll come on anytime you want me to continue this discussion. Thank you. Awesome. That's great. Thank you so much. Have a good one. You too.